I am proud to welcome you to the 2021 Leadership Lecture Series. My name is Denise Lucy, and I am the Executive Director and Professor at Dominican University of California's Institute for Leadership Studies here in Marin County. Uh, for many years, Book Passage, which is our prized independent bookstore here in San Francisco Bay Area, has partnered with Dominican. And together we have welcomed 138 world-class change-leading authors to our campus and the community. Our spring lecture series sponsor is the Bank of Marin. For 30 years, Bank of Marin has been a leading business and community bank in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I wanna thank you so much, we, all of us do, Bank of Marin, for your continued ongoing support of our lecture series. Our partner, Elaine Petricelli, who is president and owner of Book Passage, would tell you about some upcoming events after tonight's presentation. Miss Sharon Stone is our distinguished speaker tonight. She's an actress, human rights activist, artist, mother, daughter, sister, and writer. She has been honored with a Nobel Peace Summit Award, a Harvard Humanitarian Award, a Human Rights Campaign Humanitarian Award, and an Einstein Spirit Award as well as many other accolades. Tonight, Ms. Stone will discuss her book, The Beauty of Living Twice, which chronicles what she learned after surviving a significant health crisis. She will be in conversation with the Honorable Ellie Schaefer, who served as Special Assistant to President Barack Obama and Director of the White House Visitor's Office in Washington, DC from 2009 to 2017. She is currently the CEO of South Lawn Strategies, and she is working with San Francisco city and county on their high volume COVID vaccination sites. In 2016, Out Magazine named Schaefer as one of the 100 most influential men and women who inspired, shaped, and changed the world. It is my honor and privilege to welcome Sharon Stone and Ellie Schaefer. Awesome, thank you, Denise, uh, appreciate that. Um, happy to be here tonight and um, really looking forward to this conversation. And I think it's gonna be a, a fun one. Um, we'll try to keep the the jokes to a minimal, but, but no guarantees. So um, I do wanna introduce to everybody, uh, I have my own introduction for you. So, <laughs> so I have, uh, we are here tonight um, with music collaborator, producer, writer, Emmy award-winning, Golden Globe-winning, Oscar-nominated actress, star of Ratchet, Mosaic, Casino, Bobby, and of course, Basic Instinct, mother, daughter, sister, pool shark, <laughs> poker player, and now to add to the list, best-selling author of The Beauty of Living Twice. You also happen to be one of the kindest people I know. And so I'm very excited to uh, start this chat. So welcome everybody and wel or welcome Sharon Stone and welcome everybody to our conversation. Thanks, Ellie. Nothing makes me happier than doing my first book tour with you, my dear friend, and obviously with Bandit. I love um, it. And it's just so great to have my dear friend be the host of this. Um, because, you know, because of COVID, um, I had mentioned to you earlier that I haven't seen my book in a bookstore window and these book tours are on Zoom. So I'm not having that distinct privilege of reading in a bookstore or seeing the people live. So it really is very heartwarming for me to have such a good friend do this with me. And I really, really appreciate that. And thanks Heather for lending you to me for the evening. Um, yeah, I feel like it is like one of our Friday night zoom calls. A right. little bit, so. <laughs> um, so before we jump in and talk about your book, the beauty of living twice, um, I wanted to start out with something I read last night and, um, an article came out in vanity fair and, uh, the question was posed to you, what is your greatest regret? And your response was why bother? Yeah. And I just have to tell you that that's probably the best answer to that question I've ever heard. So I just, it was just so, it was so refreshing. 
it seems pointless to me. I mean, what's the point of looking in your rearview mirror? I mean, we we're learning on the job. We're learning as we go. Our best possible thing we can do is be present and do our best while we're present. I mean, obviously, if we have something to repair presently, we should know that and do it presently. But to regret, what's the point? Yeah. I mean, um, I, I totally agree. And it's just so funny because it's just like one of those questions that everybody asks. And, uh, you know, you always wonder, you're like, hmm, I wonder what my biggest regret would be. And now, now I know I'm going to steal your answer every time I get asked. So, <laughs> so I, I read your book, The Beauty of Living Twice. And I have to tell you, I, I, I laughed out loud. I cried. I found myself enraged on your behalf um, and empowered by your words. And this book brings out a lot of emotion for the reader. And I can't imagine what it was like for you as the author. Um, you talk quite a bit about your relationship with your mom in the book and your mom and, you know, in the book um, and how it's evolved over time. You dedicated the book to her um, on Instagram. There you are opening your box of books, book number one, hot off the presses, your mom standing by your side. You open the box and you hand the first book to your mom. What? What was that like? Well, I had just walked in the door from a magazine shoot and I opened the door and walked in and the, you know, the boxes, whatever boxes get delivered are usually on the floor by the front door or on, there's a table in the hall by the front door. So normally I walk in, I open the mail, I cut the boxes open, I look and see what they are. And I wasn't anticipating that it was a box of books you know you you make a movie and time goes by before you see the movie sometimes a year sometimes two sometimes even more and there's all that post-production and all the looping and all the other stuff and you know so this chasm of time goes by when you write a book it's like and then it just happens it's a much faster process so i walked in the door i cut open the box and it was the books and i was like it's the books it's the books it's the books. And all of a sudden the dogs were running around and my mom came running out. And I just, I kind of couldn't believe it. And there it was. And I had, she had come out and just, it wasn't really a plan that she would be here for the launch of the book. It just kind of happened. And it was so great that she was here. And I got to hand it to her and then I realized that she didn't know that I had dedicated the book to her. And so I handed her the book and then I had to go get her reading glasses because she couldn't, she couldn't see it. And, and, and I didn't know what she would think. And it was just really, I was like, yeah. gonna like it? Was it gonna be okay? Was she gonna be comfortable with it? Because, you know, our story is a long and winding road. And um, in fact, I wrote the first uh, pass at the book and then mom had come to visit. And of course I wanted to read it to her, but I got the flu because I was too freaked out, I think. And so, I read it to her while I was in bed. And I suppose the flu was just that sort of screen so that, you know, I felt, I don't know, some way that I could do it so that I could read it to her. And it took three days. Um, and by the second day, she was sitting in the bed with me. And by the third day, she was under the covers with me and it had brought this incremental closeness between us. And after I finished reading it, I turned on voice memo on my phone when she started talking. And I recorded, she just talked for like an hour and a half and she told me her story. And I realized that my story could not be complete without her story. And I went back and rewrote the book. 
and incorporated her story and it made my story need to be completely rewritten because I had this whole new understanding of my own, not just my life, but my femininity, my truth, my complete comprehension of my own life and childhood and what she had taught me and why and what it meant to her and what it meant to me that because I remember earlier when I was writing things for the book, I had said to her, mom, you never let me lean on you. And she said, that's right. I told you to stand on your own two goddamn feet. (laughs) And I remember thinking, okay, mom. But then when she told me her story, I realized that teaching me to stand on my own two goddamn feet was the best love, the best protection, the best self-defense, the biggest love that she had to give me because no one had given her anything, no childhood, no love, no comfort, no care, no hugs, no tenderness. And she didn't have those small lessons, those intimate, tender, compassionate lessons to give me. (coughs) And that teaching me to stand on my own two goddamn feet was her way of giving me all the things that would protect me from those who would treat me like they treated her. And there were a lot of them. Um, you're a notoriously private person. Um, this is your second book, your first memoir. Right. What, what made you decide to write it and why now? I, um, took my kids on vacation to Nantucket. And while I was there, I met this wonderful woman named Mary Haft, who was also an owner of a book company. Uh, her, she and her husband, their family owned book company, <clears throat> and she was hosting the Nantucket book, book Festival. And that year, it was all people who were writing <clears throat> about war. And I had been earlier in my life married to a war correspondent. And <clears throat> this subject is a very complex and compelling subject. And I was spending time with Mary and people had not arrived that were going to arrive to help with um, this book festival. And so I said, oh, I'll stay and I'll help. And the kids went home and I stayed. And I started getting to know these writers who were extraordinary and exemplary in their field. And I became friends with one of the writers, J.K. Weston, K.L. Weston, who wrote an extraordinary book called The Mirror Test. And I just started going back into my things that I had written. I'd gone to college on a writing scholarship and I'd written lots of short stories and some of them had been published. And, you know, I'd been around trying to get my short stories in a book form published and that wasn't going great and um he was asking me about my writing and i i started showing him my writing and he was like wow you're actually a really great writer um you should probably put this these in a book form and i was thinking about it and trying to work on that uh while they were out doing their book festival stuff and um And he was very uh, much commiserating with me on this subject. And when I left, um, I did a podcast with Mark Maron. I did his final podcast in his garage. And uh, various people heard it and believed I had a story to tell. And I got a couple offers to write a book. And Kale's editor, was a person who brought attention uh, to my story to 
Sonny Mehta, who was the head of NOF, who in my opinion was the king of literature. <laughs> so um, though I had a couple offers, I just thought that Knopf would be where I would learn the most about writing a book. And since I had not uh, written a memoir, I thought it would do me some good to work with them and have this extraordinary opportunity to work with Sonny Maida and with Tim O'Connell. So that's what I did. And then Tim at the end brought in uh, one of his compatriots, Anna Kaufman, and they helped me finish the book. And it was an amazing experience. I mean, just a wonderful experience working with them. That's awesome. And that's how it went. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's just like, so, so you know, who knew, right? Like you couldn't have planned it, it just kind of happened. No. And then I, I mean, it took a couple years for me to really write the whole book. Um, but that's what I did. And, you know, at home at night alone, after the kids went to bed, I sat in my room and laughed and cried and walked around and pulled my hair and tried to figure it out. Um, so in your career, you're, you're known for your glamour and your looks. Um, and this book, you know, in your book, you talk a lot about, know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you talk a lot about, you know, Sharon Stone, the person or Sharon Stone, the persona that you had in Hollywood. Um, and this book is a lot about Sharon Stone, the person. Yes. And I notice I find it interesting that there's no pictures in your book. Right. Was that on purpose? Yes. Yes. I mean, I really felt like um, we've seen plenty of me and everybody knows what I look like. And so many people have made up so many stories about me that I felt like just taking the image away and letting people hear from me, the person from the first person perspective would be appropriate. Like we've seen enough of her. Yeah, I thought it was very, um, very powerful. And when I read the book, as you know, Heather and I, my wife and I were like, I bet you she did that on purpose. <laughs> I did, with the, with the guidance of, yeah. of Knopf. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so there you are in Hollywood, glamorous star and boom, traumatic drain, brain injury. Right. 1% chance of survival. You have to start your life over. And we all have challenging- I mention that should this happen to anyone now, since then until now, there is a much better chance of survival. Yeah. There are greater understandings of what to do. They can do um, artery transplants now both from pigs and from human. Um, and there are many other ways that they can resolve what happened to me that they couldn't. And the percentages are higher now. They're more like 10%. Uh, it's better now. Well, modern medicine, we love it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this challenge, obviously. Um, and, and one of the things that challenges often like can bring you to your knees. Um, you seem, you know, when you, when you read the book and, and you, and you look at the beauty and you think about the beauty of living twice, so many of these challenges could like bring you to your knees, but you seem to like have found strength in these moments. Um, how did, how did you literally and figuratively put one foot in front of the other to start over? Where did that, where did that strength come from? I remember saying to someone when I got home from the hospital that I didn't know if I was supposed to live or die. And I couldn't tell if I was supposed to live or die, that I was up all night and sleeping in the day. And I was having these very strange visions in my sleep. Like there were some sort of entities downloading information to me in a kind of almost digital format 
and I was getting these kind of weird, uh, I don't know, influx of information, but it didn't seem like it was from here. And I couldn't really tell what was happening. And I didn't know what was happening to me. And I couldn't hear out of my right ear. I had this really, this problem with sound. It was like bouncing all over the place. And my vision was very obscured. I couldn't read for like two years. I couldn't write my own name. You know, my arm was just flinging all over the place. At first I was walking on the top of my, especially my right foot. You know, my face was all kind of, you know, messed up. I just was such a mess. And I, I, my long-term and short-term memory were both really messed up. And I just, I just didn't know what was supposed to go, what was, what was happening. I wasn't even, I just didn't know if I was supposed to live. And I was very distraught. And then I said, I don't know if I'm supposed to live or die. I just don't know what's supposed what I'm supposed to do. I don't know if I'm supposed to live. And I had read in a magazine that I, we wouldn't know for a month if I was going to live or not from the operation. And this person said to me, well, if you don't know, walk in the other room and take a look at that kid. And I honestly think that that kid gave me the strength to live. Wow. That just, my son was so strong. He was a baby and he was so strong. You know, um, some months, I don't remember, two, three months after the initial incident, my son was in his crib and he was really, really restless. And um, I'm, I do that kind of parenting where if the kid is restless, I put a mat down next to the crib. I don't bring the crib and the baby into the bed. I go and sleep on the floor next to the crib. So I took like a yoga mat and I put it on the floor next to his crib. And I was laying on the floor when I had a second incident and I thought I was having a second stroke. And it happened very much in the same way where I felt like I'd been shot in the head and the pain was coming across my head. And the minute that it happened, my son stood up in his crib and looked me right in the eyes. And the whole time it was happening, he stared me in the eyes and screamed at the top of his lungs. And he wouldn't break eye contact with me and he just screamed. Just one loud, long scream, but locking in my eyes. And I was just like, he is locked into this with me. And when it ended, when it finished moving across my head, um, someone ran into the room and said, what, what's going on? And I said, I think I'm having another stroke. Oh, wow. And I got in the car and was going to the hospital and I stopped partway to the hospital and was projectile vomiting out the car door. And when I got there, the, the uh, orderlies came running out and they're like, don't worry, don't worry. We were expecting this. We were expecting this to happen. This isn't unusual. Don't panic. We gotcha. And it turned out to be okay that it was just apparently whatever fragments of the initial bleed were still moving through my, my brain, it was apparently still part of it, but it was so intense. But that connection with my child was bigger for me. And I think there was just something that kept grounding me back and I just feel like it, I don't know, it gave me such um, purpose and presence of mind. I love the story of uh, in the book where you talk about Rowan knocking over the fireplace, uh, you know, tools and telling right. you to get out of bed. Right. You know, and it was almost like he was saying like, fight. Like that's you know? enough. Yeah. yeah. Get up and get with it. Yeah, I thought it was. Just, I thought it was like a very powerful moment in the book. Um, so, so one of the in in the book, you um, you know, you describe like a lot of things that happened to you, and and you talk a lot about the people who were in your life, and um, and how they influenced you know, and how they influenced you, and had an impact on you. Um, did you realize like 
that that these moments and these people were having an impact on your life at the time or did it come later um you know everybody from you know the the girl who slapped you in the face and you know to you know to boyfriends to you know your your limo driver to you know just the the people that you kind of have weaved in the story um you know in the beauty of living twice I mean, I think we understand who is important as they are important to us. But I think as we look back through our lives, you know, people, people pop up, you know, like there's a flight attendant, there's a couple of them, but there's, there is at at least one really strong, like there's a flight attendant that I'm always on his flights. Like I'm just always on his flights to the point where we're just, we're just friends. (laughs) <laughs> but there are a few flight attendants that I seem to always be on their flights and they have become like a part of my world. It's like, I know about their families. I know about their kids. I know about their lives. I know about their parents. I know what they go through. Like there are people that, you know, just start to be in your life and they just are, you know, and you don't know why these people come to be so powerful and present in your life but they do. And you're like, well, I didn't anticipate that this steward that I met on this flight one day would become my friend because now he's been on 25 of my flights and I know him, but we made friends on the first flight. You know, so you just don't know sometimes initially this person's gonna become a big, I mean, when I walked into your office maybe on day one, I didn't know you were going to become one of my dearest friends. Yeah. <laughs> and like Carolyn, when I walked into her office, which I wrote about in the book, little did I know when I first heard her voice yelling down the hall to me that I would be there with her until the day she died and that she would become so dear to me. Yeah. That's just kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, life, you know, who, who pops in and out of your life, you know, right. at times and, and that, um, in, in your book, you, you, you have a line that, that kind of stuck out to me and it was the question, what have you learned? And, and you said that I am enough. Yeah. Um, when did you stop letting others define who you were or who you are? I think that's a work in progress. Yeah. You know, I'm still um, I'm still saying to myself, you know, I'm enough as your sister just because I'm your sister. I'm enough as your friend because I'm just because I'm a good friend, not because I know somebody else or because I'm this or that, but just because I'm great with a grilled cheese. <laughs> You know, but when all these other additional things start happening to someone like me from a small town, you believe that you have to bring everybody with you into this big experience. And I'm sure you've experienced some of these things because your life became so big. Um, It's a big deal to go and work for the Dalai Lama. It's a big deal to go and, you know, run the White House, (laughs) you know, and all of a sudden everybody's like, well, I want in on that, you know, and it's hard to know where the boundaries should be. And as we grow and as we mature and as we start to recognize, you know, I'm good enough just as your sister and as your friend, it doesn't mean that I can invite everyone I ever met to the White House, (laughs) you know. Um, It's a little bit more wavy in my area because the boundaries aren't as defined as they are at the White House. Like, no, you can't get past all those people. Guess not. You know what I mean? In my life, it's harder to make the boundaries because, you know, you have to grow up and figure out where they should be. Yeah. Um, and as you make them, people are like, why? Like, like why? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um. How do you remember all the details of your life? Do you keep a diary? Um, I write a lot. Yeah. And I write a lot of poetry. I write song lyrics. I write um, 
just stuff and I just write it and put it down. And before computers, I write, I wrote stuff and I put them in, put it in a duffel bag. And um, fortunately, this was a duffel bag that no one knew about. So I just wrote and put everything in this Louis Vuitton duffel (laughs) that I had in the closet with all the rest of the luggage. And I just would write things and throw it in this bag and throw it in the bag and throw it in the bag. And then eventually when the computer language became easier for me, I started transferring everything into computer files. And then I took those computer files and I took them off of my computer and put them on a hard drive and put them in a safe somewhere so that someone couldn't take my computer or get in my computer or start managing what I'd written. So it was a series of, it's in the duffel bag, now I'm gonna put in computer, but I also wanna still put it like it's still in the duffel bag. So I have to take it off the computer and put it somewhere else, (laughs) you know? So it was a series of keeping my stuff somewhere and out of harm's way. Gotcha. Um, So you just kind of actually touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, we have, we have mutual friends. (laughs) Um, 20, 2013, you received the Nobel Peace Summit Award for your work in fighting uh, the fight against tragedy of uh, HIV AIDS and His Holiness, the Dalai Lama handed you the award. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, do you want to see it? Yeah, we do. Want to grab it? <laughs> Up in the mantle, right in there, in the right in the middle of that mantelpiece. I'll show it to you. What was and, what was it like to be recognized for your humanitarian work? And I know it wasn't the first time, but it was from the Dalai Lama. I got that letter. <laughs> <laughs> it came that I was being considered for it. So the first few pages. Um, were that I was being considered for this award. And I was reading it standing over the kitchen counter. And my my really dear friend, um, who had been my painter, my house painter, at this point for like 35 years, was sitting at the kitchen counter. And he was like my uncle. He was sitting at the kitchen counter eating. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm being considered for the, the Nobel Peace Summit Award. Oh my God. I said, I have. And m- my assistant, Tina, said, I don't think you read the last page. And I went, what? What? What do you mean? What? And she goes, keep reading. And then I got through like the first three pages, and the last page said, and we've chosen you to receive it. And I just started screaming. What? <laughs> what? What do you mean? What do you mean? Me? Why me? Why would they pick me? I don't understand. Why would they pick me? And Robert, my dear friend and house painter said, looked up and he said, honey, of course they picked you. And I was like, really? And he went, come here, come here. And he started hugging me. And I was like, oh, oh. Uh, I went there and they gave me this. Wow. Which is, you can't really tell in this light, but it's blue, Crystal. It's blue. You When you see through it, it's blue. And it's really amazing. And it had one more leaf on it before one of the kids got to it. <laughs> but isn't it beautiful? It's gorgeous. And congratulations, really. Because um, it's you know, really kind of like, wow. <laughs> like, I know, it was, I know it was a few years ago, but it's still, you know, it's just, it just like a whoa. Yeah. Um, so I flew to Poland. Yeah. And the president, Les Velez, who, come on, did a peaceful revolution in his country, like Vachov Havel. Um, in the Czech Republic, the only two countries that have ever done this, that have done a peaceful revolution and taken their country out of communism into a democracy, which is to me like this most astounding and amazing thing that I've ever even heard of. And I've gotten to meet both of them and spend time with both of them and talk to them about what they did, which is just, 
mind blowing. And I got to spend a week there and to spend the week with all the Nobel laureates, these Nobel laureates who chose me and to hang out with them and hear what they did and all of the things that they did to receive the Nobel Peace Prize and to experience all of their incredibly brave, just wildly brave and amazingly innovative things that they did was just the greatest honor of my life. And, and that I get to now know them and interact with them. And like just now, we've been working on getting the COVID vaccine to be a non-patented thing so that it could be free for the world, for second and third world countries so that everyone could get a COVID vaccine. And just today, Biden decided, yeah, I'm for that. And I'm gonna take that and go with it. And it started out with just this tiny little group of us, like three of us who were like, we've got to get that COVID vaccine for everybody. And we're going to get all these world leaders to sign that we want this. And, and we got a hundred world leaders to sign that we wanted the COVID vaccine for everybody. And then we got to present it to President Biden. And, and, and he said, yes, today. <laughs> I mean, that's what happened. I got to meet these people. I got to I get to work with them and I get to work on things like this, getting the COVID vaccine for everybody to, in the world. I mean, that's what it means to me. Yeah. It means that I didn't just get to get like, oh, good job, Sharon. I get to <laughs> actually work with these brilliant people who work in their most profound compassion in the most innovative and expressive ways. And I get to continue to do that. Yeah. It's everything to me. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's um, it's pretty neat. Do you have a fam uh, favorite Dalai Lama quote? Oh, there it is. Warriors of democracy. Warriors of democracy. Right there. Right there it is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, do you have a favorite Dalai Lama quote? Or There's I will so go many, but or he did, how about he this? Did. Or favorite uh -huh. Dalai Lama quote, or one thing that Tenzin has said to you that sticks with you in the back of your mind. Well, there's a lot of it. I, know. I was a tough student. <laughs> Tenzin, just so you know, is the Dalai Lama's cousin who HH, which is his holiness, the Dalai Lama, but I call him HH. Um, As one he, does. He's sent Tenzin to be my teacher because I obviously needed some <laughs> help. Um, Tenzin is the greatest and I was a little tough student, <laughs> um, but um, many things. I remember his holiness saying, it's like your brain has two tubes <laughs> in and out. And if one of them is filled with anger or rage or upset, you're not going to be sending out any clean, thoughtful, compassionate energy. So you got to clean out that tube, like just skip it if that's what's happening. And I always thought that is really just simplistic, clear, clean cut thoughtfulness. Like you got to go walk that off before you can be doing this with anybody. I remember thinking that was just really wise. Um, but Tenzin has often asked me like why, and I'm sort of finally done with it. I piddled around with so many small things, like trying to work out so many things. And I was like, because I can. And he was like, but if you just did what you're supposed to do, everything would fall under that umbrella. And I think it took me until now to really get with discovering myself fully, writing the book, and being present for what is actually important. It took me time to really show up for that. Um, you're very vocal about your political activism, hence the Warriors of Democracy secret decoder ring right there. <laughs> um, over the years, 
you probably, you know, you get tugged in a million different directions, right? Whether it's raising money, whether it's using your or star power, you know, things like that. You get t- tugged in a million different directions. Over the years, how have you decided what issues you want to advocate for? Well, I like to take a rather apolitical position in what I advocate for. Um, because I believe that being a humanitarian is about everybody. And it isn't a political thing. Now, not all po- politicians believe that. I believe that everyone deserves a safe roof over their head, enough food to eat, and an education, and clean water, and the right to appropriate medicine and care. Not everybody thinks like that. Um, so sometimes it does become a political issue but it shouldn't be in my opinion we should be there is certainly enough food enough water and enough shelter on this planet for everybody um so why should this be a political issue so my humanitarianism does bang into political issues on occasion well it's it's uh it's always fun to watch (laughs) Uh, well, just because I say the truth and I know I love I it the truth so often that people do sometimes get offended by what I say but I'm not saying it to offend yeah I will say like it, it was one of the funnest times that we've had exchanging texts and things was during the election you know and and uh because it was just there was so much going on and you know you could just it was just it was a very fun time but um all right can we switch gears and talk about the movies let's go <laughs> All right. One of my favorite movies, Casino. You know this. <laughs> well, it's a very well-made movie. I mean, you got to look at like Marty Scorsese, uh, the godfather of filmmaking. Um, you're looking at uh, Robert De Niro, one of the finest actors to ever live. Uh, Joe Pesce, I mean, Get Serious, Jimmy Woods great actor, Nick Pileggi, incredible script, great research. Um, I mean, you know, great backdrop. How much fun was that movie to film? I mean, I know it's a job, but. You know, I was supposed to go for five weeks. I was there for five months. Um, Five months in Vegas is, (laughs) not exactly what you want to call fun um and we had to work in the casinos and we had to work around gamblers and the big whale gamblers so you know we worked you know we could get in the casinos when we could and so sometimes we'd work you know unbelievable hours 22 23 26 hours you know we just worked when we could So we, there were times when we were just, you know, walking into walls and falling down on the job because we were so tired, we couldn't think straight. And there were times when it was so awful, it was hilarious. Like when Bob and I were fighting and we would have these knockdown, literally knockdown drag out scenes where he was dragging me down a marble hallway and we were fighting like crazy and the whole you know the film you know we do these takes till the film ran out because we were still shooting on film in those days and the film would run out and bob and i would just be (gasps) (laughs) (laughs) and we'd be laughing and the whole crew would kind of be plastered against the wall just horrified and we'd be like you never had a fight (laughs) you know and they would just be looking at us like you people are insane and we would be so in it that we were just, you know, so it was sometimes funny when it shouldn't have been and sometimes horrible because we were so exhausted. By the end, we were so tired. We didn't even know our own names. It's it's actually one of my, one of my all time favorite movies, but it was also one of my favorite movies because something happened to you on that set. That is uh, one of the things that 
you told me I'm tapping into our friendship a little bit, which I'm, I feel like I'm like now okay. going into, all right. Um, and it was kind of like, it was one of those moments that it was like, uh, maybe you had something, uh, your cat fell out. <laughs> <laughs> I had already been in the hospital. I had, um, my left ovary fell and grew into my hip bone because I had really bad endometriosis and I had to have emergency surgery and I was in the hospital. And it's really hard because we're in a really tight schedule. So like, they were like, you had to go to the hospital now. And I'm like, that's not how it works in movies, kids. We have to like wait until they can schedule me out. So I can't go to the hospital now. I can go when they can figure out how to schedule me out for enough days that I don't blow production. So I'd already done that. I'd already had to leave set and they had to reschedule around me. So I was on set one night and I had a cap on my back tooth and it came off. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not gonna tell anybody because I can't just cause another problem. I just can't. I mean, I'm on such a big movie and it's the biggest break ever. So I tried to crazy glue my cap back on my own tooth. Don't try this at home. Um, so I put, I take it out. I dry off my mat, my thing. I dry off with a hair dryer the cap. I crazy glue into the cap. I'm like drying with a hair dryer, like <laughs> trying to keep it dry. You know, I put the cap on, and of course now I've got crazy glue all over the place. I've got it on my tongue. I've got it on my other teeth. I've got it on my fingers. It's on my lip. And I'm like trying to hair dry it, you know, I'm trying to like do some sort of weird home dentistry in my motor home. And of course it doesn't work. And now I just got crazy glue on my tongue. And I'm like, and I'm horrified because what can I do now? So now I'm so hung dog and I have to go tell Marty, Marty, my cap came off and I tried a crazy glow back on and it won't go on. And I now have crazy glow on my tongue and I, I just don't know what to do. And he's like, Jesus Christ, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? I, I'm like, I'm doing it because it's three o'clock in the morning and I've got an exposed nerve and I can't, and I don't want to shut down the show and I don't know what to do. And I'm sorry. <laughs> and he's like, for God's sake, Sharon, we'll get a dentist, get a dentist out of bed. And I'm like, okay. I, <laughs> I was just horrified. Because, you know, earlier, you know, or in my career, like a movie or two earlier, I needed a root canal. But, you know, you can't shut down movies for a root canal. So I'd had a root canal in my trailer at lunch with no Novocaine so I could go back to work and I didn't have to take up any additional time. So, you know, in a motor home, there's that tiny little table between the two bench seats. So I'm like on the tiny little table, someone's <laughs> holding a light, from the lighting, you know, crew, and I'm getting a root canal. Well, I'm sort of scrunched up on this table and the dentist is trying to do this root canal <laughs> at lunch. I've got like 40 minutes to get a root canal. So it's just like that, you know, there's no, people say, what happens when you get sick? You don't get sick on a movie. Well, they pump you full of whatever, vitamins, drugs, whatever, and you go back to work. That's what happens, <laughs> you know? So of course I was gluing my tooth on. I just, you know, it is, I just think it's one of the funniest stories, but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you could have a dinner party, Hmm. with three of your favorite co-stars oh who would they be that's so great huh wow because i've had a lot of good ones oh, right right jeez well, for sure, Richard Gere, because I just love him. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> and I've had so many good, good ones. How about um, the monkey from Atchet? 
God, I love that monkey, Pedro, and I miss him. Like, I miss him. Like, I really miss him. Because, you know, when you have a co-star that's actually on your head, um, it's different than a co-star that's in front of you that you talk to. You're really working in this alliance. You know what I mean? Like, your performance is both of your performance. You know, you do your performance together. You know, you make decisions about what you're going to do together. And it was so fun. It was so fun. He would come in in the morning and hug me. And he would hug me for like five minutes and talk in my ear going. (laughs) And we'd have these great talks. And we developed this really cool rhythm about whether we're going to be funny or whether, you know, like they would tell him to be good. And I would say, depending on the scene, you don't have to be good today. (laughs) Be really bad. Like act up. Do whatever you want. Don't listen to them, you know be really a stinker and you know he would or he would be really good depending on you know today's the day we got to really be good you got to stay up here you got to like do this you know what I mean um and he was really super cool um and he would be a great dinner guest because everyone wanted to know and hug and love and get those great kisses from Pedro um And I don't know if I get to consider Meryl Streep a co-star because she was a star and I was there for five seconds, but certainly I would love to know her further because she was so lovely when I met her. Um, In your book, the story of running into her and Patti Smith and Donna Karen. Yeah. um, And it's like, I want in on that party. (laughs) I mean, Patti's someone who I've, who I've gotten to know over the years and who I've run into many times. And, You know, Patti Smith is obviously a complete genius and her life is so intriguing and wonderful. And I find her an absolutely riveting performer and an astonishingly good storyteller. And her book on tape is really interesting, really, really interesting. Um, Yeah, she's so cool. I mean, I can only say like when um and i think i did write about in the book when she had me come on stage and stand in the wings and i've stood on the wings with really i mean i was in the wings with the rolling stones i've been in the wings with lots and lots and certainly with amfar i put some of the greatest performers in the world on stage from whitney houston to oh my god like gigantic performers i've had the great pleasure of literally handing them out to the stage um or bringing them off the stage or helping them with whatever they're doing. Um, But standing there and watching her, and I was really right, like at the edge of the stage. And she finished and turned around and grabbed me and put her chest to my chest. And she's like, do you feel it? Do you feel it? That's what it's like. And I know you can do it because I saw you in casino and that's what you do. And it was like, I could, I could feel it. I really could feel that she had taken that huge energy of performing live on a stage like that. And I was like, no, I don't know. I don't know if I can really. (laughs) That's pretty big, Patty. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty big. (laughs) Um, What do you consider your biggest personal triumph? Because there's, 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 there's a lot to choose from. Keeping my kids together. Yeah. Um, Being a good mom. Um, I think that when we decide that we're going to have kids, you know, we have no idea what we're doing. We have this kind of general idea, you know, oh, we're going to have kids. Oh, look, it's a baby. (laughs) You know, you know, and then, you know, four months later, your back is breaking and your arms are falling off and you think, wow you know, and then you do it again and again, and you sleepless nights and worry and, oh my God, and then this happens and that happens. And I remember when I took one of them to the doctor and the doctor, you know, was trying to diagnose my kid and then ran out and didn't come back. And I said to the nurse, well, you know, what's going on? And the nurse popped her head and said, oh, he has scarlet fever and ran down the hall. And all I know of Scarlet Fever was the black wreath on the door in the old black and white movies. And I went, 
what? And I followed her down the hall and I got as far as to where the nurses were gathering with the doctor. And I went, he has scar, and I didn't even get scarlet fever out and I passed out face down. Oh, geez. <clears throat> because I thought, oh, my kid is going to die and we're going to have a black wreath on the door and the horse and buggy is going to come by. I mean, the whole thing just hit me so hard. And they went and they smelling salted me and they went, no, no, antibiotics. It's all OK now. And <clears throat> you just have no idea when you're a mother. Like none. Like nobody brings you up to speed that like there's something called fifth disease and your kid has it and like fifth disease what's fifth disease well there's chick kick and pox measles mumps you know smallpox and now there's fifth disease and it's called fifth disease you don't even have a name for it like what are you talking about like they don't you're not prepared to, for all of this impact of oh, my kid you know these things that happen you know and you're one minute you're bathing your kid in the kitchen sink and the next minute they're six foot tall <laughs> yeah, right. you know i remember the day my kid got bigger than i was and i said you're just gonna have to sit down for a second because i have to process that you're larger than i am and that's a big moment my children are bigger than i am you know there's it's just this incredible journey that we go through as parents that are both full of t little and big things and you just you don't see any of them coming i mean you see of course the day-to-day -day simple i gotta get the food on the table and the pride that i have that guess what i paid their tuition and the foods on the table in this absolutely unstable career that i have in this completely unstable environment I'm still getting that food on the table and I'm still paying for their school, <sighs> you know? So, so that, you know, I, I just kind of, you know, we're winding, we're winding down here and you did, you did kind of lead into my last question. So I appreciate that. So one of the things that, you know, I, I, I have the, the privilege of, of knowing you and, and being around, you know, the house and, and, um, you know, and the boys and, and, and you do like in the book talk about, um, you know, the, the chaos in the house, right. And everybody around the kitchen table. And um, I, I do have to say to, to folks watching tonight, it's, it's so unbelievably true, <laughs> that, you know, but it is, it's, it's lovingly chaotic and um, it is, it is actually just like, so uh, peaceful to be around and just, it's just this, you know, this, this beautiful time or this beautiful place to be around. Um, in the beginning of your career, and, and we're wrapping it up here, in, you know, in the beginning, your, your um, dream was to be a big Hollywood star. Yep. Um, and now you're living another dream, right? You're home with your three sons, different focus on your career, less pressure. And, and as you say, you know, coming home to a house full of love. Yeah. Um, can you just like briefly just that evolution of that dream and, and just, you know, touch on, on how that, how that happened briefly? Well, there were a couple of pivotal moments. I mean, at, at a certain age, I realized, geez, you know, I really want to have kids and the superstardom was so, so big, you know, I realized, you know, I could keep going with the superstardom, but I don't think I'm gonna to get to have a family if I do that. Um, it was very, very difficult uh, for men to figure out how do I be with her? And <clears throat> the whole, basic instinct thing had been so overly sensationalized it had been turned into a three ring circus and i just felt like oh, i gotta get away from this and i sort of made this decision i should try to get married and have a kid and i tried to do that <clears throat> and then everything just blew and then I had to decide, 
um, what do I want to do next? And I decided, you know, I'm going to go for what matters to me. I'm going to reach out to uh, an adoption attorney and I'm going to go ahead and adopt another kid. And I would just, I don't even think, I don't know what had even happened. I mean, I filed for divorce, but I mean, my divorce wasn't even final. And I called this adoption attorney and he's like, this is the call I've been waiting for. <laughs> and it was like, seemed like seconds before I had my next kid. And then I had this dream when Laird was four months old that I was having, getting another child. And, you know, we have these dreams that are just dreams. And then we do have these dreams that seem very prescient. And <clears throat> so I called the adoption attorney and said, I had a dream I was having another child. And he said, you just got one. <laughs> I'm like, I am really fully aware of that. Um, nevertheless, I had this dream and it was very clear. And he said, well, you're a witch. Uh, so yeah, I'll get, get back to you. And he called me in less than a week and said, I have your child. Yeah. And I said, how do you know? And he said, it's the same birth parents. Wow. And I said, oh my God, and I'm broke and I'm trying to get on my feet. And I just don't even know if I can go back to work yet. And I'm just, my life is falling apart and coming together simultaneously. And I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And I literally <clears throat> went upstairs and I was trying to talk this out with my first son who was five, because that's the only person I really had to talk to. And so I was like, what do you think? Where would we put this kid? And he's like, well, we could put him in a dresser drawer. And I'm like, you know, my mom did that with Uncle Mike and look how that turned out. Uh, so I was like, you know, joking. And he, and uh, so we just started, I started really thinking like, how am I gonna do this? And I came upstairs and I went in my room and I literally got on my knees by my bed and I started praying and I'm like, I would really like to know how to do this, but everything is going wrong. And if I'm gonna be able to do this, you're gonna to have to give me a sign and it's gonna to have to be really big cause I'm really in trouble and you're gonna to have to make it like neon so that I can understand it because I don't have any idea. I have no money. I've lost everything. I've lost my career. I've lost my marriage. I'm just in terrible trouble and I don't know what I'm gonna do. And in very short order, I sold my house in San Francisco and I got a contract from Dior in Paris. And I was like, oh my God, thank you. This I understand. <laughs> and I'm gonna be able to do this. And in the meantime, I had already started supporting the mother. That's so awesome. She would be okay. And I was like, I'll support her but I don't know if I'm ultimately going to be able to take this child, but I will make sure she's okay till we know. And then I was, and then that's my family. I love it. I think it's just, it's such a, uh, it really is. And it's so well thought out in the book and how you end with talking about your, you know, your sons and, uh, it's great. So, um, in The Beauty of Living Twice, you write about an old Irish toast that says, I am more of who I am now than I was when I got here. And I hope the folks tonight watching have experienced that. Thank you so much for opening up with us. I'm going to turn it over to, um, to uh, Elaine Petricelli. And um, thank you, Sharon. And um, it was great talking to you. Thank you, Ellie. It's always good to talk to you. Do you know, I, I'm Elaine Petricelli from Book Passage, and I do get to see a lot of events. I felt tonight that I was in uh, a restaurant where two friends were talking at the next table, and they didn't mind if I heard. Mm -hmm. And it's just charming. It was the most beautiful event, and to know the work that both you, Ellie Schaefer, 
and use Sharon Stone do for our world and both in the small uh, house with your three fabulous sons and in the whole world. I It's just a, a very inspiring evening. And I want to, I, uh, I want to say that The Beauty of Living Twice is a book that you're going to read more than twice. It is beautiful. And because you have a ticket for tonight's event, your book is going to come with a signed book plate. Sharon was so gracious. I can imagine it got a little tiring, but we're all going to treasure our signed books. And uh, we're so lucky that the Bank of Marin, our wonderful community bank here, uh, has supported these, all of these lectures this year and made this possible. Uh, they are an amazing bank and uh, their support of Dominican and Book Passage uh, is never ending. We're so lucky. Uh, Dr. Denise Lucy, who came to me years ago after we had done one lecture for some reason together, said, let's keep doing this, let's do a series. And it's been one of the most wonderful experiences for me and for everyone at Book Passage. Sharon and Ellie, I hope when you're next in our neighborhood, you'll come by our Ferry Building store and our Corte Madeira store are open, or you can come see us online at bookpassage.com. And if you see Patty Smith, tell her we all remember when she came to Dominican for our series and for Just Kids. What a, I can see the two of you together. Oh my goodness. Uh, and thank you for your friendship with each other, Ellie and Sharon, and for letting us share in it. This has been an amazing night. And this ends our spring series, but we'll be back in the fall. And of course, at bookpassage.com, we never quit. And we'll be having events every week. So come and see us. Thank you all so much and good evening. Thank you.